Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Lima, the director of Enchanted, and today I'm going to lay down a little director's commentary for the film. You know, we never did one when the film came out uh, back in 2007, so I thought it might be nice to give you some insights, some behind the scenes as, as to how we made the movie. Um, you know, I should say this to begin with, that this is all my opinion. This is all how I saw it going down, and if you recorded a different person, they'd give you maybe a totally different story. So this is all just my insights and how I made it through the movie and um, the things that I was thinking about while, while putting it together. I think the way we'll do this is that I'm going to play the, the DVD right off camera here, and I'm going to do it by chapters. I'll press play. You can put in your DVD or Blu-ray or watch it on Disney Plus and follow along. That would be a great way to do it. So, I'm trying to think if there's anything else before I dive in. I'd like to give you a little bit of history as to how, how I became involved in the film before pressing play. Um, Bill Kelly and Sunil Perkash, they were a, a team. Um, Bill a writer, Sunil a producer. And uh, they pulled together a draft, a spec script of, um, of Enchanted. And it was about a fairy tale princess. Not necessarily animated at that time. They went out to the studios with it, and of course, Disney grabbed a hold of it. I think they had a big bidding war. Um, then it went into development, about seven years of development before I got involved. And uh, they were just trying to figure out the movie. They had a couple of directors who came in to, to guide it. Didn't quite work out. And I think one of the problems they were having was that um, their take maybe was a little bit too cynical. And when I came in, I said, hey, why don't we do a love letter, make it a love letter to Disney. And um, they kind of bought into that idea, and then we went on that journey. Um, I'm trying to think, that might have been around 2005 when I got involved. Um, I was helping out with another project at the studio, and I was told that if you helped, uh, you know, if I helped them out, that they would give me a, a film to develop, and Enchanted became that film. So maybe we should just jump in. I'm gonna press play over here on my TV. And uh, you can press play. I'll actually prompt you and tell you when to press play. And then we can watch the movie together. And I can talk a little bit about uh, what I was thinking and what was happening at the time. All righty. Here it goes. So we start with your typical Disney opening, which is the castle. Um, we're going to give you a couple little surprises right away to tell you that maybe this isn't what you were expecting. So we pull back. Big Disney theme, let you know that this is truly going to be a love letter to Disney. And unexpectedly, the camera pushes in. Boom, and we zoom right up to a window. We go inside that window, so we're actually going inside the Disney castle. And we see a book, and most Disney animated films, especially the princess films, open with a big old book. And this room kind of looks a little bit like Sleeping Beauty, and you'll see throughout I make references to those, um, those films a lot. Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, and Cinderella. Julie Andrews is narrating, and I thought, well, there's no better way to open up this movie. I'd done a, a couple of TV movies with her, and I thought that she would be great uh, to help us open it. We zoom through, and we go into a different aspect ratio. The whole thing sort of squashes down to what Snow White might have been filmed in. And we keep going. Not only do we go through a castle window, but now we're going to go through Giselle's window. You, um, you can probably tell if you have any art history background that uh, we made this all based on, you know, Maxfield Parrish and um, Alphonse Mucha. So the designs are all based on their work, sort of lots of curly cues. Um, and we get our first Easter egg, which is... Um, Giselle looking into the two blue diamonds, which is just like dopey. Uh, you're going to see lots of Easter eggs, especially Snow White, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty during this. Um, Giselle introduces her prince, and if you've watched the movie all the way through, you'll know that this is the outfit that Robert wears at the ball. So we specifically made, wanted to create that connection between Robert being her true love so that it feels inevitable as we move on. 
Um, we get our first song. The songs were written by Alan Menken and Stephen Schwartz. After doing a little exploration, trying to figure out who should write the piece, Dick Cook, who was the chairman of Disney at the time, said, why aren't you using Alan? And uh, we said, well, maybe that felt a little too much on the head. So we went off looking for other writers. And at the end of the day, he was right. Alan was absolutely the most perfect of composers for this film. He had written these kind of pieces before. He was really ingrained in Disney history. So we started writing. I guess this was the first song that we wrote, and it was a toughie. We wrote many, many versions of it, and I think Alan had a version that he loved, and I had a version that I loved, and uh, we ultimately had to get together in the same room and wrestle it out. Uh, not physically wrestle it out, but, you know, um, just come to terms with what the piece was going to be. We go into this very typical you know, Snow White moment where you call for your forest friends and they all show up and help you, help you out. Here's a little joke. I knew that uh, the frog princess was going to be coming out, so I put in a frog princess Easter egg. And then, uh, and then she tries to figure out uh, what his lips are going to look like. There's an apple with a bite out of it. We do that later, too, in the film. And, of course, that's based on Snow White. Let's see. What else can I talk about here? Stephen Schwartz was the perfect uh, lyricist for this. He totally understood how to wink at it, but not let the audience see that we're winking. That's treated completely sincerely. All of the songs are just like, from, from Giselle's point of view specifically, very, very sincere. And that was really what I wanted to do with the whole piece, is to make sure that it was, that it was a love letter to Disney, that we weren't going to make fun of it, we were just going to love it. And having grown up with uh, always wanting to be an animator and loving Disney, it seemed like the perfect, uh, the perfect way for me to uh, attack the material. This dancing scene is very much like uh, Prince uh, Philip and Stefan dancing after he's met, um, after Philip has met uh, Aurora. We kind of used it as reference even. Um, these guys are, are just, you know, the, the three of them really, Nathaniel, um, Tim Spall, James Marsden as uh, Prince Edward, and Amy Adams. They just sort of fall right into the characters and, and they don't make fun of them at all. They believe in the theatricality of them. Their world, this animated world is real to them and they carry all of that into live action like perfectly. I really couldn't have asked for better, uh, a better cast, to be quite honest with you. Um, the animation was all done by James Baxter and his studio. Um, had a whole group, or right there you see that the, the, the troll is running over their heads and he's wearing little dresses. And those dresses are um, Cinderella, Snow White, and Sleeping Beauty's dresses as if he had already eaten them. And he actually has earrings of the Little Mermaid shells. But I was talking about James Baxter, and he had a studio at the time, and Disney didn't have any animation studio, 2D animation studio then. So we, um, so luckily, James, one of the foremost, you know, he's su such a brilliant animator, was available to take this on. I mean, we really got lucky, really lucky. And um, he brought on a bunch of animators uh, who were all Disney animators, really, um, and pulled us off. Perfectly. I mean, it feels like a Disney movie to me, uh, something that might have existed so long ago. Now, all of these shots we use in the live action ending of the film as well. If you notice, almost shot for shot, they're the same. And um, only in reverse, Giselle saving Robert. Here, Edward saves Giselle. Um, and that's all been, that was all planned out in advance. When we put it together for the animated piece, we thought, let's use this as closely as possible in the ending and flip it on its ear. Funniest line, gets the big, biggest laugh, um, you know, when he, when he says about getting married in the morning, um, which plays right into the cliche. And I was always nervous that it took us this long to get to a laugh. Um, but I think it really plays into the sincerity 
of the piece and you get it really grounds you in okay this is who these characters are and this is what we're going to get from the film they're going to be completely completely sincere this is a, a shot that we took basically from the end of Snow White um, with the with the sun setting and they're riding off into the sunset where they're going to live happily ever after. This water motif that you see here is going to play out for Nerissa throughout the entire movie. We're always going to see her watching a scene through water. Susan Sarandon plays Nerissa. She's fantastic. And here we get a little um, sense of what's to come because we have her turn into a dragon. At the end of the movie, she turns into a dragon. One of the hardest things, and one of the things I was really interested in doing is, was creating this, this sense of one, oneness with the characters from animation into live action. And I wanted to make sure that you really felt like they were the same character. So one of the things we did was we, we actually recorded live action reference, mainly of Amy. Um, and we used it to inform the animators as to how Amy was going to play the role. And as we went on, we would send the animators footage of, of you know, scenes that we were shooting. So that really allowed us to, to bridge the two worlds. Even with the costume designs, we were starting to do rough costume designs for animation. And then when Mona May came in, she created these wonderfully animated costumes for the live action characters and then we went back and redesigned all the animated characters um, costumes to match. So it was a really a back and forth, a constant back and forth of figuring that all out. We had to wait till uh, we had the old hags uh, makeup done before we could actually animate any of the old hags so that we could create that oneness of world. So with this section here, this next section by the waterfall, we, we used a lot of live action reference. And in fact, Susan wasn't available, so uh, my friend Fiamma Fricano stood in for, uh, for the old hag. And um, I think this really paid off in a big way. You can see here she uses her little pinkies. Um, and these hands, and the way Amy uses her hands throughout the entire movie, sort of gives you an idea of her character arc. So watch her hands throughout. They start like this, and by the end of it, she's just using them like a normal, real woman. Um, here we go, the transition to the, to the real world. Some of this is animated, some of it is CGI visual effects, and some of it is the real Amy. So, um, look carefully, here we have a combination of visual effects and 2D animation. And as we move forward, this was the way that, uh, we covered her with sparkles, with pixie dust. We thought this was actually you know, a great Disney transformation. Sort of, we've seen sparkles mean very sort of light, happy things in the past, and here they're really violent. They're actually pushing her into the new world, um, into the real world. We do a little, I'd, I'd say this is kind of like a little Alice in Wonderland trick here in which we start with one perspective, and then we're gonna turn the whole thing upside down turn her upside down, in fact, and push her into the real world. She's confused, she doesn't know what's going on, and it's only going to get worse from here. So here's this big camera move where we twist the whole world, we turn it all upside down, and then she comes out into the center of Times Square in New York City. Um, the original script actually had her arriving in Central Park. And I thought, well, that feels a lot like Andalasia. Is there some place in New York we can go which is much more aggressive? Oh, the, you see this, this manhole cover, and it's designed to look like Andalasia, as if it is really the entrance to Andalasia. Um, but I was thinking, how can we get some juxtaposition that, that is more harsh? And this seemed like the perfect, the, perfect, the perfect place, really. This was the very first shot that I shot on the entire movie. Um, the first day was actually this night shoot in Times Square. Closed the whole place down. We brought in our extras, we brought in our cars, and um, we had to get all of this in one night. Um, it was a lot of work, and I was really nervous. Everyone was really nervous, really, that if Amy got hurt on this night because we're going to slam some cars, 
sort of around her. If she got hurt, then we were going to get shut down because, uh, you know, if she went into the hospital, then, then we, were, we were dead. Um, but this all felt like the right juxtaposition. She moves from a fairy tale world in which everything is happily ever after to this aggressive, sort of everyone is aggressive with her. Um, and she can't seem to catch her bearings. Um, this down shot is actually her stunt double. We had a second night, actually, with second unit um, to work out some things. And uh, here comes our first sort of cross-world uh, joke. And it took us a while to, to get the rhythms of that working. And Grumpy, she thinks it's a character from Snow White. We had to get out of there in one night, so this is how we did it. We put her down the subway. You notice she falls forward on top of those guys because there is no way that she was going to be able to make it down those stairs in that dress. And then we do a little of visual effects cross dissolve here of two worlds. We stitch together a different subway in a different part of town, and we bring her out up into in the world. And this was a location that was much more um, easy to wrangle. Um, and we had this all for a night as well. This through the next se section was all done in a single night. Oh, we cut out a little piece here. You see those women in the back, they're prostitutes. She had a little uh, interaction with them, but it just, it just sort of stalled us out for a moment. And it seemed somewhat cynical. And so we were trying to avoid those kinds of jokes. The movie started to tell us really that those kinds of hard-hitting, more cynical-esque jokes weren't going weren't gonna to sit in the movie all that well. This guy who plays the old man was uh, Edmund Lydeck, and he was, uh, he was Judge Turpin in Sweeney Todd, which was the first musical I ever saw. So when he came in to audition, I was like, that's the guy. I want to work with him. And he couldn't run very fast, so when we're in this behind shot, that's, uh, that's our stuntman running for him um, because Amy was catching him every single time because uh, he was a pretty slow runner. This shot in the rain, I was, I was fought with constantly about it because rain costs money and we were looking about how to keep the budget down. And um, I thought it was that we needed it. We needed to put her at her lowest low. Robert, Introdu introduction to Robert. Um, this was a scene, and you'll see many of them throughout, that we shot after we had finished shooting the movie. We actually went back and did some reshooting, um, added a couple of scenes, some additional photography. This was one of them. Um, we originally met Robert with his daughter. Uh, he picked her up at a, at a karate lesson. And we just found that we needed more backstory, that it was becoming a, the movie was becoming a two-hander, and we wanted to know more about who Robert was. Um, Oh, that sign in the background there is uh, the three songwriters from, uh, from Snow White. So we named the law firm after them. Easter eggs everywhere. I won't get to all of them, but I'll try to get to some of them. Jody Benson is playing uh, Robert's assistant. And um, this, too, she had to come back for. So she was originally just in the one scene. We brought it back for this just to gain some, you know, like I said, some insight into who Robert is what he's dealing with in life. Uh, now we meet Morgan, his daughter, and he gives her a, uh, a book, which is a book that I don't think many kids would be happy with. <laughs> and um, she, uh, she doesn't seem so thrilled, but dad's trying to make the right impression, even though he is somewhat mis misled in his, in his opinions. He is the opposite of Giselle, and we use this book in this situation to sort of play that out. We get a phone call from his girlfriend, his fiance, and uh, we see that Morgan's not so thrilled about her. So we're setting up as much as we can. This was all shot on a soundstage. So we had loops, background loops that we were playing, um, and we rained the car. It was a wet day inside the soundstage. Um, it was hard. It was hard, hard work. I wouldn't have thought that being inside a car would be as much work, much hard work as it was, but it was tough. Um, everyone was wet. 
Uh, we had a long dialogue scene. We have a six year, uh, I think she was eight years old playing six, um, Rachel Covey. And um, so, you know, we had the start and stop. The loops were short, so we had to back them up constantly. Uh, so I think tempers got a little hot this day, um, just figuring it all out. Um, more rain. So um, this is another night shoot. Uh, the whole billboard section was shot in one night. Amy wanted to do as many of the stunts as possible, so you'll see her climbing on cars and hanging from the billboard. Um, completely soaked, so everything was slippery. Um, you see her climb on, this is her climbing on the car. She does this, gets up there as much as she can. There was a little apple box there for her to step on, a couple of steps. This is, I believe that this is the stunt double, um, climbing up those, those ladders, uh, that ladder. And here we are with Amy again. She's connected actually to that, to that billboard with a, with a wire. And we took them all out digitally later. We couldn't take a chance that she'd fall. Um, Robert uh, picked his daughter up at uh, karate. And in this scene, you can sort of see the, the, the scene that we cut. We had an exterior of, of him picking her up at karate. And now uh, you can see her, her outfit. Um, let's see. So a lot of back and forth. This, of course, even mimics the animated section at the beginning when she falls into Edward's arms. Well, now in live action, she's going to fall into Robert's arms. And we're putting in all these little hints that they belong together, that they are supposed to be together. Um, here's Amy doing her own stunts. Um, she didn't do that fall, uh, luckily. And um, Everything gets turned upside down. I think this is a really sort of, I think, one of her funniest scenes in which Amy holds completely. I mean, that was what was remarkable about Amy to me, is that she could hold on to the character, a theatricalized character. And she was like this from the very first moment we met in the audition. She hadn't done, I mean, she had done a, a bunch of films. But um, I think her latest film was June Bug, but hadn't come out yet. We got to see it to sort of get a sense of who she was. And then she came in for an audition. And I had like a, a 102 degree fever. And I forgot that I was sick. That was pretty, probably not a good idea for me to do auditions with that, you know, being sick. But I forgot that I was sick for a half hour. We were doing 10 minute auditions and I spent a half hour with Amy. And I knew right away that, that there was nobody better to play this role than Amy Adams, that we'd found Giselle. The studio wasn't always so hot on bringing in someone who wasn't a big star, but, uh, but we fought the fight. And um, ultimately everybody saw that she was perfect. I sort of thought of it as like, you know, Julie Andrews had done a lot of Broadway, but wasn't really known to the audiences. And when she was Mary Poppins, you thought of Mary Poppins first. And that's what I wanted for Giselle. I wanted you to think about Giselle first. And then Amy, it, her career just took off from this movie. It was, it was really a great introduction for her and perfect for the movie. I don't think uh, the movie would be totally different with a different actress. I can't say enough good things about her, really. Part of the trade was that uh, was that the studio said if we're going to hire if we're going if we're going to hire Amy they'd like a big A level star to be Robert, and um, one of the first names that came up was Patrick Dempsey and he came in and did a did a test with Amy and they just had chemistry they just had it right away, so uh, so they became our our leads. You'll notice that the apartment is pretty clean here. This may be one of the big flubs. It's a little messy, tiny bit messy, but it's pretty clean. When we come to this later, before Happy Working Song, the place is a dump. So I don't, I don't know if anybody really notices that, but, uh, but we really messed up the apartment so that it felt like there was something really to clean up. Take a look at these shots and you'll see how, how just how different it is from when we, when we, uh, when we do Happy Working Song later. Um, 
So this is a nice little scene in which we get to see that, that Morgan totally believes that Gisela is a real princess, that she yearns for more of a fantasy life than maybe her dad is willing to invest in. Um, Robert's been really hurt. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But it really shows sort of the, the, his unwillingness to, to compromise and to, to, to allow his daughter to invest in something that's not real, in a fantasy. Um, this moment with Robert is really the first time that you see that he is, he's connecting to her. And of course, a push in, push ins, sort of help you go inside a character's mind. And that's what we're doing here, is we're starting to make a connection here that something's going on inside of Robert. Uh, I tried to put Easter eggs in this room, but it's interesting, Stuart Wurzel, our production designer, wouldn't let me. He kept taking them out. I'd want to put Disney objects into the room, and he kept just grabbing them and, and taking them out of the room. I think there's a couple of them in there. Now we go back to animation, and we see Edward coming into the world, followed by Pip. Um, because we've already done the transition with Giselle, we don't have to do it again. We know it's going to happen. We anticipate it, and here comes Edward shot uh, two different pieces put together. He didn't come out of that in the, in the middle of Times Square. But now we did a day, Edward's day, in Times Square. Again, we shut it down. We were crazy. It was, it was incredibly difficult. And Pip comes out as a CGI character, who in the real world, chipmunks don't talk, so Pip does not talk. I was always, uh, I had a little stuffed chipmunk that I would do in the scenes, and I would always do the little voices um, to show the actors what, what was going to happen ultimately in the animation. And I would do all these little squeaks and, you know, and then those things ended up being recorded. My editor used them as scratch, and uh, I ended up being the voice of Pip at the end of the day, um, which was fun, fun for me. Um, so now, that is, that, you know, that is James Marsden running on top of a car. I think we dented the top of that car. And uh, now we head into Happy Working Song. Giselle wakes up in the morning, and if you look around, the place is pretty messed up. We, um, we really put a lot of extra, you know, uh, dirt and grime into the, into the scene so that she'd have something to clean. I mean, look at it. It didn't look like that when we came in earlier. Um, especially when you go to the, the table in the, the kitchen. Um, look at it. Oh, well, we didn't see the kitchen, but we did see the dining room. Um, and uh, you'd think these people were just like pigs. <laughs> That's how much stuff we put in. Um, she goes, and like in the animation, the same shots that we did uh, with the animated characters we're now doing in live action. So we're just repeating those same, the same things. Most of the animals are, uh, most of the vermin are um, CGI, but there are some real ones. I think you can tell when they're real and when they're not. Um, the flies were all CGI. Some pigeons were real, some were not. Um, this one was not. Uh, this was a little joke that uh, storyboard artist Brian Pimentel came up with, that there would be a one-legged pigeon. Most of these are fake, are CGI, but those pigeons are all real. Um, those are real. We put a little peanut butter on the side of a, a rat. Um, and we just figured it out scene to scene. Brian Pimentel, like I said earlier, storyboarded this whole sequence. He was my head of story on a Goofy movie and Tarzan. We worked together a lot. He's great with songs. And we boarded it and, you know, basically broke it down scene by scene and figured out where we could put real animals, where we had to use fake animals, or CGI animals, I keep calling them fake. Um, these are all CGI created, those, those cockroaches are all, we didn't have real cockroaches on the day. This is a scene like an Easter egg, this looks a lot like a scene from Cinderella. And uh, we just worked it out bit by bit um, with the track. I don't know why she's in the closet, but she danced out of the closet and all of these roaches are CGI so she's just dipping her finger in singing to 
creatures that aren't there. Um, but she doesn't seem to mind, which is interesting. When she first sees them, she's a little like put off, but she has a real positive attitude. This was all shot on set, so we built this, this whole thing. Actually, Robert's apartment was all a set. This balcony is a set. When we pan over here, it's all green screen in the background, and we put in you know, some scenes, uh, some, some footage that we actually shot on location at the real building. I was always amazed that that actually worked out because I tried it in the past and it hadn't worked out so well, but here it looks, it looks great. You never know. Um, again, all these animals are CGI. Um, wake up Morgan, and now she's going to interact with some CGI. Those are CGI. Um, that was actually, we just pulled it, the sock was real and someone just went through the scene and laid it on her head. And uh, all of these pieces are just coming together with some practical effects um, and some CGI effects. So, one, in this tag, uh, Brian came up with, uh, for the one-legged uh, pigeon. Morgan wakes up dad and they're gonna go into the middle of this and we're going to basically use a whole lot of real animals here. So when you see them picking up the, the, the rats, those rats are real. We're flying real birds through. Um, those are the, the cockroaches of CJ, real birds. We're, we're sort of like letting birds fly into his face. Um, real rats, um, we were told that it wouldn't hurt them um, to pick them up by their tails. And these animals are CGI, so Patrick does not kick real, real rats. Um, I'm sure this was made in 2000 and, uh, 2006. I'm sure we would have to do it completely differently today. Um, and now we move into Giselle like Cinderella being wrapped in a CGI towel with CGI animals. Now she's got the real towel on. She was wearing a little swimsuit. Um, and uh, again, we just figured it out like bit by bit. How could we stitch these two, these two together? Um, she doesn't know much about the world, which makes me think that she's never taken a shower ever and whether or not animated characters take showers um, or use a bathroom. This room seems to be magical to her, which uh, I can't remember ever seeing a bathroom in an animated film, but here we go. Adina Menzel, the most asked question I get about her is why doesn't she have a song? And uh, we'll get to that later, but she did have a song which got, uh, which got cut. Um, I thought that the contrast between Adina's sort of urban, sort of more, more, you know, she, she, she just doesn't have any naivete about her. She's a real practical woman. Um, who lives in the business the business world? She's got a career. Um, she's she's everything that we think about when we think about New Yorkers. I think you know um, she's a little she's a little harder. She's a little bit more confrontational than than Giselle is, and they seem like the perfect. They were also like I mean down to like the way in which we dress them. Adina has dark hair, which puts her in you know a nice juxtaposition. With, uh, with Giselle. So um, my producer wasn't happy because I, um, I cast Adina without, uh, without asking. We just cast her. We thought she was perfect. And uh, I think he would have liked to have you know, more say in that, uh, in that decision. Sorry. Um, who would have thought that I'd be so ahead of the curve with uh, casting Adina? I mean, she... She's gone on to sing one of the biggest classics and be in one of the biggest Disney animated films ever. So maybe, in fact, Adina is an Easter egg. Um, okay, here we go. So we're taking a step with, with Giselle now. She was in her wedding dress, how she came to us from, from animation. And now we're going to take a step towards her being more real. Um, she's made a dress. And uh, although it's not a a Disney film, like uh, Maria and the Sound of Music, she's made it from the curtains. We had to get multiple, you know, make multiple sets, 
Mona May picked the fabric, then we bought enough fabric so they could make drapes, and then enough so that they could, you know, cut up the drapes and actually make uh, the stenciled pattern. I think there's wire inside each one of those stenciled patterns because it wouldn't, there's no way it would stay up on its own. So I think so much of the humor, it was interesting while we were filming, when we were filming, the, the animated turned real characters were getting laughs on set. And Patrick, who, who has to play it straight, wasn't getting laughs. And I think he was uncomfortable with that. He thought, you know, here I am in this comedy, but I'm not getting any, any laughs. But ultimately, and what we talked about was your reactions, you being flabbergasted by this, is what's going to be funny. Because we've we've come to accept the animated characters as being theatrical and over the top. But, but Robert being sort of perplexed by the whole thing is what was going to be funny. And ultimately, that turned out to be very, very true. When you watch the movie, you're laughing because you, you're, you're, you're seeing the movie through, you're seeing the, the events through, through Robert's eyes. And um, I think ultimately, when, when Patrick saw the movie, he said, oh, I totally get it now. Um, back to animation here, um, we see everything through water, we make that transition through water. Um, back to Nerissa. Um, Nathaniel clips off the hedges and I always felt like um, seeing the movie afterwards, and we didn't think about this when we made the movie, that it would have been funny if Nathaniel came into the world with a live action hedge, um, a hedge head of, of Nerissa, but, um, but we didn't think of it. So. Uh, so only in retrospect can I say I wish that had happened. Um, this is a stunt double of Nathaniel coming out of the hole. And then um, when we pull him, we pull him up and out over the cut, it becomes Tim Spall, who, who I think is, is one, of the great, one of the great actors, one of the great British actors of our time. I, I really adore that man. We spent a lot of time together having dinner, going to dinner and stuff, um, and, and he just believes it, like, like Edward does, you know, like, uh, like James does. And here we are with Edward, James Marsden, riding a bus, and James did ride that bus um, around and around the block in, in Times Square. We had, we probably did three or four takes. That bag of bird seed that you saw, Man, I was so scared because there's a spring-loaded blade up above that woman holding the birdseed. And uh, if she had moved, it would have went right through her skull. <laughs> we were all very, very nervous. Um, here's, our, here's our hidden Mickey um, in the bus driver's hair. Um, she was totally game. She wanted to do it. We, we asked her if she'd be up for it, and uh, she really, really took it on. Again... Pip was a little, I was in the scene with Pip, doing all this with, uh, with the actors, um, which was, I think, I think quite funny for everybody watching. And I love that the actual um, spectators, people who are on the street, actually look at what's happening. So often you watch these movies and they go on as if, like, something may be happening in the street and they don't even look at it. Um, so we made sure that when we had these fairy tale characters running around New York, that people noticed. Um, here we are at the Warner Center. There was a longer section here where she thought these statues were giants. Um, but again, for just to keep things moving, we, um, we cut that little bit. So this was the first, season, the first time we saw Jody Benson as Sam. Um, and um, I was so happy that she decided to do it. And in fact, you'll see throughout that we used um, a bunch of um, actresses who were Disney princesses in the film in little cameos. I'll, I'll point them out, you probably know them. Um, if you listen to the, to the Muzak playing in the room, it's uh, Little Mermaid music. I think it's uh, a part of your world here. This gag, Amy did really put that fish in her mouth. Um, she was game. I'm not sure it works 100% uh, because you don't, you don't see the setup as well as I think you, you should, but she was totally game to put that fish in her mouth. Um, again, through water, we catch Narissa. This was one of the scenes that we reshot. This scene originally took place in the bathroom at the deli, um, and the apples came up through the toilet. And it was pretty gross. 
And again, something that we felt like maybe was too cynical, Dick Cook again pointed it out. So we reshot this at uh, Musso and Frank's in their kitchen. And um, we, we just, you know, we just went to town and put it in a, put it in a pot of soup. And those, those apples that you're going to see in a minute are all uh, released, magnet released from the bottom of the, um, the pan. And they are on strings and they are made out of rubber. So they float. And we had to just make sure that we kept the center clear so that, uh, so that we could put Nerissa into that pot of soup. Um, even when he picks them up or when she pulls one down, we, we had to do that all practically on the day. So we were working with vocal tracks to get the timing of it. Um, I always thought, and we tried to not touch the soup, but, but Nathaniel like hits the, hits the water a couple of times. And I'm thinking like, isn't he burning his fingers? All those bubbles, it was not really, you know, it was not really hot. We were just creating bubbles in the bottom of the pan. But um, looking back on it, I think I would have, uh, I would have been a little bit more careful in how he pulls them out of the, the soup. Um, here we go. So we're going to head into the deli out front. Um, going to chase Pip, and Pip's going to jump across a couple of people when we, when we come out into the, the main room here. And those are the light and, lighting stand-in actors that he's jumping over. Uh, to get to him. I like to put the, my, my stand-ins in the film as much as I can every once in a while, and uh, so you get to see a couple of them up there in line. This was a fun day because I got to be a part of it. I got to really be a participant in the middle of the scene. Not only did I lay everything out with the chipmunk, but I also, from the side of camera, did all the dialogue and would give all the actions. Now he jumps up on. Now he runs over here. Now, and I would do the lines, you know. Um, it's good. I would do all of that live. So I really felt like I was a part of the scene. And they are so good at, at being able to triangulate their eyes. This is something that I learned from a lot of talk on um, Roger Rabbit, that you have to sort of look at a point in space. The actors have to look at a point in space and imagine something existing there. They can't look past it. If you look past it, it doesn't look like you're looking at the character. So there's this thing where you kind of cross your eyes a little bit to make it feel like you're looking at something that's in front of you. And I think both of these guys, are, and Amy too, are just great at making that happen. And it really gives some believability that that character is, is standing there right in front of them. Um, this, you know, um, the, all the animation in that scene was also done by, um, by Tippett and um, with uh, Tom Shalesny as my supervisor. And being a character anim animator myself, I thought it was really, really important to make sure that the acting on Pip make him felt like he made him feel like it was a, um, he was an actor, a participant on the day, like he was actually there. So he spent a lot of time figuring that out, figuring out, um, how to make him feel present. Um, and it was really important to me that we weren't just grabbing a bunch of visual effects artists, that we were actually bringing in, in animators, people who, um, you know, animators who were actors, who could actually do performance, as opposed to just making something move. I wanted to make sure that there was a sense that they were thinking. Um, this divorcing couple, um, are the Bankses. We named them after um, the mother and father in Mary Poppins. All the character names tend to, to do that. Um, Nancy's last name is Tremaine. Um, she's going to become Morgan's stepmother, so we named her after um, Lady Tremaine from Cinderella. So here we go. Um, she's going to start enchanting the world. So we bring her out into public. She actually doesn't understand why someone would get divorced. Later, we're going to see that she's totally with her, you know, with her naivete and her true belief, uh, her belief in true love, um, that it saddens her that in this world, divorce would exist. exist. So we'll see later that uh, although they're angry now, it actually has... Uh, being in contact with Giselle has, has changed them, has transformed them, has 
enchanted them. Um, this was a character that had many more scenes. And um, he had a couple of scenes later on where he, where he and Robert had some conversation about what was going on. And we just found that it didn't, it didn't really serve the purpose of, of the film. It didn't keep it moving forward, that there wasn't, a, there wasn't a sense of us taking a step in those scenes. So we cut them. All right, we're going to go into Central Park. And um, we spent a lot of time in Central Park. So, so here we are at the, I think this is outside Columbus Circle. Yes, it is. It's, out, uh, it's by Columbus Circle, the entrance there. And they let us climb on this statue. I was sort of surprised. I asked, hoping that they would, uh, that they would agree, and they did. In fact, the city was pretty much agreeable to almost everything we wanted to do. There was very few things that they said no to, which was, which was wonderful and got us into not hot water, but we were, we had hard days when we were in the city. Ah, shooting Patrick Dempsey in Central Park. Right out of camera, left and right, behind us, there was a crowd of probably a hundred people all day, every day, while we were shooting Patrick. Um, Grey's Anatomy was huge. He was a big star, like dreamy. And um, it was hard because they were loud and uh, constantly screaming for him. And he did the best thing possible is that he actually went up and talked to them, gave them some time. Before most shots, you know, he'd go and talk to them and sign some autographs and ask them to be quiet so that we could actually shoot the, shoot the scenes and he wouldn't have to go back in later and redub everything. And from that point on, they, they, were, they were quiet, um, which was nice. This bird lady we're gonna see in a second is the same lady from um, the bus. And we called her the bird lady, and um, it's, you know, we're doing an homage to Mary Poppins to feed the birds. She gets a little bit of information here, and then she's pulled in by Robert, because Robert sees that if he doesn't, you know, it, it, it just touches him, first of all, that she's given him all of it, uh, given the bird lady all of her money. But she knows, he knows that she won't necessarily survive on her own. This next section, we were losing the light. And we, you see it's very, very shadowed and gray. The sun was low. And we had to do it as a one -er. And we hadn't really done this kind of shot in the film yet, this kind of like a long walk and talk. And I was a little nervous about it. Um, we were always getting pieces. In fact, uh, Patrick would always yell, pieces, people. In fact, we put that little slogan on the back of our, back of our hat if someone would flub up a line. Um, but we did it. We got through it. We got through that as a one -er. We're going to start to introduce a lot of characters here that we're going to see later um, in the song. That's how you know this, uh, this little crew of uh, stilt walkers will show up later. We're eating a hot dog. We're in the very opposite corner of the park, so there's obviously been some, some time shift. In fact, if you know the park, you can tell that we're cheating a lot during all of this, as we're actually moving from place to place, um, abstracting time, I guess. Ah, the candied apple. So you look at it. He's gotten these apples, right? And we made this, this skull face out of caramel on it, sort of like the apple in Snow White. Um, and of course, it's not, it's not real. Oh, his pants, the back of his pants, we had a little apparatus that we put in his pants that wiggled about and was able to like open up the seam. And then we put Pip in later. Same thing with all of this. We'd have little, we'd have these little apparatuses made in which would shuffle around the, um, the, the popcorn. In fact, I think that may have been someone's, whenever we could, that may have been just puppeteered with somebody's hand, and then we put Pip in later. Um, we continue into the park. We're getting, we're getting closer and closer to this, to this argument that sets up the song that's about to happen. You can only imagine how, how difficult it is to shoot in Central Park, and I guess today they might do things a little bit differently. 
maybe maybe add some green screen shots um, maybe shoot in other parks which we did a little bit of a tiny bit of pickup work in a different park um, that apple landing on that helmet is um, is visual effects um, he just rode by we cued him for the hit and he acted as if it hit him we'll see later how that poisonous apple plays out um, yeah, but I really felt like I wanted to be in the place and feel the place with the people. Um, and I also thought it would be kind of remarkable to do a huge number in Central Park. I don't think, uh, maybe since Hare, had they, had they actually done this much shooting in Central Park. Ah, she starts to sing. You know, these are like the, these wonderful moments, and, and, and they're very dangerous moments of getting yourself into song. Um, we were lucky to, to have Robert as a counter so that when she starts to sing, he can react to that, which pushes her to keep singing. And then when someone else joins in and she enchants all of these musicians and singers and dancers to join in, um, it's not magic. It's not a magic enchantment, but she has this just something about her that wins people over. This guy playing the guitar is my, is my neighbor. Jeff Watson, he was a lead guitarist in the, in the group Night Ranger, and I asked him if he wanted to be in it and play the guitar. Another homage to, uh, to the sound of music. Um, not a Disney movie, but there you go. These guys, these old folks are all Broadway hoofers. They've been in so many different movies and on Broadway, the guy in the yellow jacket was in Mary Poppins. He was one of the chimney sweeps. The two guys together there, they were in uh, West Side Story together. So we got to, we got to actually, uh, you know, work with these, these old time hoofers and I'm still friends with a couple of them. Set up the King and Queen's ball, so it's gonna come up later. And um, may I suggest that you never shoot boats on water all choreographed with each other. We must have done this scene 12, 15 times uh, just to get all the choreography to work. Ah, the wedding. This is probably the biggest argument that I had with my, with my DP because I wanted to shoot during um, when the sun was out with all that speckled light and he wanted it all to be, um, for consistency, he wanted it all to be in shadow. And so we were, we were going at each other a little bit uh, on that day. Um, uh, German festival. There are lots of uh, parades and festivals that happen around uh, the park and on the streets. I knew that Rapunzel was going to come out in the theaters, so I put this little Easter egg that's coming in. That's my daughter right there, and um, I put it in as like an advanced Easter egg. Um, on either side of Robert are our choreographer and the assistant choreographer. Um, I'll talk a little bit about them in a moment. This was all shot second unit. We went and we, we set it all up. Um, James wanted to do everything. And in fact, in most of the takes, he wasn't hit um, and it didn't look right. So he just asked them to slam into him. So that was, that was sort of interesting that he was willing to take that on um, and to make, to make it look as real as possible. He was rigged on a big crane with a, with a, with a, with a wire. So, we got the idea for a lot of this by walking the park. John Cha Cha O'Connell and I um, went uh, went on a couple of weekends and looked around to see what was going on. There was, you know, there uh, there's this construction. There's picnickers. There's uh, roller skate, you know, roller skaters. Um, one of my favorite shots in the movie. Um, everybody crossing the bridge. There are all kinds of folks, and we kind of put together this little um, map of where we thought each one of these groups would sit in the song. And he actually drew this little map of where they might all, you know, fit into different sections. They, they choreographed and rehearsed for two weeks before we came here uh, to shoot it. And it took us probably, I want to say, seven days to shoot all of these pieces. So much like storyboarding, Cha Cha would 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 do a little you know would would make a map which was like a storyboard in a sense so I knew immediately how to read it and I knew what was you know how much time we had and how many shots we could do 
um, and the amount of time, and uh, we worked it all out. It was great. I think there were 200 extras. Um, I forget how many dancers. There must be there must be close to 100 dancers, 75 to 100 dancers, um, in the piece. Probably our biggest day. Um, had a huge crane. It was it was exciting. It, it's you know it's a, it's a time that I will I will remember forever. One of my one of the greatest times shooting shooting a movie. Um, there's that hat, that helmet. We put a little bald spot on the guy as if it had burned a hole in his head. This is Nancy's design shop. And we had a scene, a second scene in the shot, which was earlier, that we cut out. Um, again, it just wasn't moving the story forward. So this is the first and only time you see it when it's under, under Nancy's um, ownership. You see it again later when Giselle takes over. Um, Real birds and that little that little love heart uh, um, floral arrangement, and uh, it's a little bit of a a little bit of a stretch to go to a ball that night and be able to get your costumes together and all, but but I think because of the momentum of the movie, you just buy it. Okay, so we're about to go to Brooklyn, and you'll see right off the bat here there's a sign, and it's a reference from Cinderella. It's the Grand Duke Hotel, um, and um, our two guys end up uh, at a seedy hotel. We used to have a big scene in the lobby in which they checked in, which again was a little too cynical, um, making fun of them. And uh, we go into the room. The whole room was built on a bunch of tires so that when a train went by, we could flicker the lights or we could pretend a train was going by, flickering the lights and jostling the room. Um, and uh, the TV is a magic mirror. And we get a little bit of information from it. And we also get Paige O'Hara, the voice of Belle, in a, in a scene that is reminiscent of uh, some dynamics, maybe from Beauty and the Beast. And it also informs Nathaniel's love of Nerissa that isn't being returned. Um, and the music in the background of this, the, the, the score to the, to the actual soap opera, is an overly dramatic piece of music from Beauty and the Beast. Um, so here we're back with Pip, and uh, this box is puppeteered a little. We pushed up a little, a little device through this... Uh, pre-scored um, cut in the box. Um, I did all the acting again as Pip on, on James Marsden's knee, just figuring all of that out, acting in the scene. It was another, another fun day for me. Um, and then we'd take Pip out of the scene and he'd have, to, he'd have to do it again to me as an actor off screen, doing all the same um, you know, dialogue and actions. Um, we're going to take Pip now, Nathaniel's going to take him, and uh, put him in the stocks, which is like a little hanger that we clip him to. We'd never be able to do that with a real chipmunk, of course. Um, but hopefully everybody knows that this isn't a real chipmunk. Um, so, you know, just trying to figure out the, you know, we have to figure out the, 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 the compositions without there being a real character in there. So you're always working around, so he's this big, he'll hang this far. On the TV, you see that we used uh, Fun and Fancy Free. I can't remember exactly why we used it, but um, it might have been that it was just uh, something that was affordable, maybe, for us. I can't remember if it has any, any meaning to the actual um, events that are happening in the, in the scene. In a moment, there's one scene of a, of a coat hanger, and I was actually, when I was a teenager, I was a puppeteer. So I, uh, I actually puppeteer this little hanger as it walks across the scene. Here we go, right there. <laughs> My claim to fame, Pip's voice and puppeteering a coat hanger. Um, a lot of this stuff we just all shot, you know, this is being shot on a crane, his points of view. We actually shot like plates of, of the camera like racing down along a, a piece of um, electrical line, this electrical line, all of this was shot on location. 
And this also, we just ran our camera down the down the um, down the electrical line, and it's just a matter of figuring out. You know, it's always about how does the animated character fit into the scene. Um, here we go, dinner. One of the main reasons we did reshoots or additional photography was for the beginning of the scene. Um, we wanted to give more depth as to why Robert was alone, what had happened in his previous relationship, what his relationship was like, um, and his beliefs. Um, so we reshot the beginning of this. If you notice, there's a certain point where his hair <laughs> shifts from one style to another, and it's because we didn't match it very well, didn't notice on the day. But we had to recreate, we shot in an actual Italian restaurant for the second half of this, and we had to recreate pieces of that restaurant on a stage. So we rebuilt that restaurant in LA. Um, it, was, it was a lot of work and we tried to get extras who looked like the extras in our scene and dress them the same way. So it was a lot of work to, to stitch this all together. But I think ultimately worth it. And part of it is that, and I said this I think earlier, is that we totally underestimated Robert's role in the movie. That we thought we were following Giselle and that everything should be from Giselle's point of view. But as we put together the first cut, we realized that we were missing half of the relationship. Um, so we did a, you know, we shot a lot of extra stuff to sort of make that work. There's, there's just, and I think it was evident from the very beginning, there's just so much chemistry between these two. You, you just yearn for them to be together. You know, they're each, they're each struggling to understand their worlds. And um, coming up, you're going to see us uh, move to the original footage shot in the Italian, re in the original Italian restaurant on location. And the big, the, the way you can tell is right there, his hair. It's just different. It's not as, it's not, doesn't stand up as high as in his quaffed. So we're going to go into another action sequence very soon with Pip. Um, and this was all shot on location. Um, we added some things to the, to the space, like there's a, a pizza oven, which, we, which we, put a big, uh, we put a big false front on. The poison martini. He's coming up with any plan possible to get rid of this girl. Patrick has this great reaction there where he, where he sort of sees what's going on. And in fact, you know, we, we, throughout the entire movie, we made a lot of effort to make sure that we had as many reactions from Patrick looking at, uh, you know, looking at the circumstances from the outside, kind of the audience's eyes. Um, little joke here about how it is poisonous, um, being alcohol and all. And um, now we're going to go into the sequence, a big action sequence, big. Big for Enchanted, with Pip, in which um, Pip and Giselle reconnect. And I remember Patrick at this time saying, like, well, what should I do? I don't know what to do. And uh, um, we had a little conversation, and I was like, well, what would you do if you were, you know, in this circumstance? And he said, I'd just try to kill it. <laughs> and we thought, like, well, that's not going to be very helpful, really. Um, so we decided upon, because Pip has to live, right, for the rest of the movie, and we decided upon that, um, that probably the second thing he would do is protect. So he goes right into protection mode, um, trying to figure out what, what's going on. A little rig underneath a rubber pizza that we, uh, put together, and, um, the pizza then gets tossed into this stove, this oven, and, uh, Poor little Pip, you think he's dead, or our characters think he's dead, but he's actually has been pushed out by the flames. And uh, we see later that, uh, that he's okay in a later scene. But of course, this is uh, distressing for Giselle, and Nathaniel actually thinks he's accomplished something. Back at the hotel, we're shaking that room. There are like some, some, some guys on big handles shaking the rubber of the room. And... Um, Thinking that it's the magic mirror, um, Edward sees that uh, he uh, he sees where Giselle's at because she comes on screen, 
and um, he gets the name of the restaurant. On the screen, um, he sees a reporter, and when the reporter signs off, she has three names, and um, we named her after the actresses who played Snow White, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty. And um, so it's a little funny, another, another Easter egg. And here we are in uh, Morgan's room. You can see in the background there's a book from Cinderella. I did get a couple of things in here. Um, real, real tender scene. I was really touched by the amount of time that Amy put into a relationship with, with Rachel. And I think the, the reality of, of, of them on screen and Amy really investing in Rachel really comes across. Um, I think it's easier for adults to show up on the day and put themselves into the moment, but it's harder for kids. Uh, the Bellinote Restaurant. This is named after, of, co of course, Lady in the Tramp. Um, Italian restaurant. That's where we got the name from, made that connection. And then we follow Edward through the apartment building. And we shot sections in a real apartment building. And uh, we did the same thing when Giselle arrived. There are sections of it that are, that are in a real apartment building. Oh, the dog peeing on his foot. The dog didn't really pee. It's a little apparatus they make that uh, they train the dog to lift its leg and they just pump yellow water through it. Um, so he goes into the building. All of this climbing stairs is in a real apartment building. Real apartment building. Our set. And um, he walks up to a door and we use this same door three times for all the different inhabitants um, of the apartment. That's Judy Kuhn. She's the singing voice of Pocahontas. Um, she came in and did that little section for us, which was really nice to have her. Um, and then different, uh, the cat really hiss on the day. <laughs> and um, this barking uh, that comes on the other side of the door, we, were getting, we weren't getting like a great reaction from, from Jimmy just jumping back. So I like screamed at the top of my lungs. To, uh, to get him to react for real. Um, sometimes we play these little tricks. Um, this is our set again. And then we go to my favorite scene in the whole movie, actually. Um, this scene was a surprise to all of us. Um, we knew that there were elements that were gonna, that were gonna play themselves out this is a big transition scene for, for Amy. We talked about, so we worked through all the beats of it. But on the day when she reacted the way she did to being angry, it was sort of a revelation to all of us that, that this character really had a limited repertoire of, of experiences. And one of them was that she had never been angry before. Um, there's a, there's a tenderness that I really think Patrick brought to the scene where he wants so desperately to help her. He's obviously falling in love with her. That's, that seems like it's, you know, the, 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 that, that sort of arc is playing itself out. And I think he wants her to be real and he's willing to, to confront her, to, to push her over the edge. And here it is, this, this moment that I love so much when she feels anger and then it totally flips on her and she's, she's thrilled and elated that she could feel this new emotion. And um, I'm so touched by it. I cried on the day watching it and Amy came in every single angle. She came right to it with the same, with, with the same intensity and depth and I'm, I'm just moved by it every single time I see it. And it's, it's like, I mean, it's watching two experts, you know, handle their craft. We didn't rehearse a lot of these, these pieces ahead of time. I think because I really wanted 
Patrick to to react purely to what to what Amy was bringing. It's 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 so like confrontational in a way to be in a be in a scene with with a character like this who who can come at you from any place. So when when she touches his chest or when there's a, a an almost kiss. I think these things on the day play maybe with a little bit more intensity. We get Amy's reaction to what happened and this is what we shot on the day. And then the reverse side of this, which is Patrick in his, in his bedroom reacting, we shot as an additional coverage. Again, feeling like we needed to get the other side of the story. The next morning, we're going to get another step in Giselle's arc of becoming, becoming a real woman. She's made another dress, this time out of bed sheets, and it represents, you know, if, if the last dress was more fairy tale-ish, this is leaning towards being more real. It still has fantasy elements. And that's something we really, really wanted to hold on to, that Giselle's not going to give up who she is in order to live in the real world. And I think that's one of the things that makes this movie so wonderful, is that she hangs on to her naivete. Into the scene comes Edward. Um, and where we're now confronted with the, the, the dramatic issue of the, of the piece is we know that they're falling in love, but will, will they end up together? And Patrick's reactions in this section are, I think, what makes it funny. I mean, Jimmy is great and committed. He jumps all over the furniture. He, he you know, he confronts Robert. Um, but it's really Patrick's reactions to how over the top this is. I think that makes it makes it hilarious, really. Um, Jimmy, when he plays that reversal, he plays a lot of the time where he moves from being sort of bombastic to oh, okay, ordinary life. Oh, that's the way you feel. Okay. Um, and now we're going to take another step with with Giselle, in which. Edward is still a cartoon character in the real world, but Giselle can't sing back to him. In the cartoon, she would have just taken that step and they would have just joined in duet. And here, she can't do it. She can't sing. Um, and she finds it odd that he's asking for her to sing with him. Um, and she doesn't quite understand why. And all of these things, all, all these steps were planned out in the script. And then Amy took them and added a, a, a physicalness to them. As you notice now, she's no longer doing this whole sort of pinkies up princess thing. She's no longer, like when she moved in the beginning as a real girl, she felt like a ballerina. She was almost like a dancer. And now she's much more grounded. She uses her body in a totally different way. I love this grumpy lady who walks by. She just sort of gives him a, a dirty look out of the corner of her eye. Um, so, here we have uh, their goodbyes, as if they maybe will not see each other again. You'll see in a little bit that we had to do some retakes in this, this section too, so we did some additional um, shots here. And they'll be really obvious, I think. Uh, we shot them against green screen and um, ultimately just put in a plate behind them. Um, and if we're lucky, maybe we can catch uh, Robert's hair changing again. Yeah, so this is, I mean, really what we were trying to go for was something that was, you know, uh, emotional. And the reason we did the, the extra footage was to just heighten that a bit, to actually have Robert express what he was saying as opposed to just um, just having us interpret the, the depths of his, uh, his loss. All right, so they, they got on a date. And into the scene, here are those shots. So this is green screen, shot against green screen, and that one also, that one, and this one. So 
Again, we have uh, Nerissa showing up. She shows up in the bottom of a uh, sparklet sparkle bottle. And uh, so she's watching everything. And um, shows up, we do this transition where you think you're in the bottle and then you ultimately go to a martini that Nathaniel's drinking. And Nathaniel has been through a little bit of this, this self-exploration of, of he adores this woman, yet, uh, yet she treats him so badly. Um, in a moment, Pip is going to come back into this scene. She's so angry that she screams. And we did this as a practical effect and just burst all the bottles all over everyone. Um, they're, of course, made out of sugar, so you don't really, you don't feel glass and you won't be cut up. And then Pip poops. And uh, no matter how hard we try, we always try not to put a fart joke into an animated movie, one seems to always make it in. So I felt it was only appropriate <laughs> to put one in this film. Um, the Bankses get back together again. And um, I think what this scene does is it, is it ultimately proves to Robert that, um, that Giselle really has worth in the world, that, that her ability to, her positivity and her naivete and the way she grabs a hold of it can affect the world. And this scene tends to, um, to do that. I always want to look away when they start making out like Robert does. Like he, he looks away, he's a little embarrassed that they're so in love right in front of him. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge, another day, it was really, really windy here. Another day when we had huge crowds of people just like jamming up the streets. Um, we tried to give a visual sense here that that Giselle is stalling. We, we put all these, we gave him the foam crown and the I Heart New York uh, cup to give it kind of a sense that, that they've been to a lot of places. And she just doesn't want the date to end because she doesn't want to go back to, to Andalasia. And in fact, what she's really saying is that she's in love with somebody else, that she's changed, that she's a different person. Um, Unlike the scene, the, the, the one or the walk and talk in um, Central Park, we had a lot of time on the bridge. Um, we knew it was going to be a difficult location to shoot, so we gave ourselves some time. So we, had a, so we had the time to actually do long takes as they walked across together. Um, so it made this scene easier, in a sense, because we weren't under any pressure. And we could also cover it. We did some coverage to allow us to, um, you know, to interrupt the scene and bring in different takes. Um, Morgan as the fairy godmother. So she kind of makes some um, Giselle's, you know, Cinderella dreams come true. So we actually dressed her up like a, like a fairy godmother, gave her wings and a, and a wand. And she has, she has the perfect answer to, uh, to making Giselle's dreams come true and it's uh, dad's emergency credit card. Um, this was a little controversial at first and we questioned a lot about like, would a kid be able to use her dad's credit card? Probably not, but, but we thought we could just go with it. This woman, the saleswoman at behind the desk here is Mona May, our, um, our costume designer. And we're gonna come up in a moment on our producer Barry Josephson, and he's uh, he's working inside one of the uh, one of the dress shops. Here he is coming down the stairs. That's our producer Barry. And then this whole thing is capped off with a conversation at a at a beauty salon. Um, I remember this being a tough a tough shoot, only because we were we were crammed for time as you typically get in these in you know in a film having to make decisions of what you're going to keep what you're gonna um, what you're gonna get what you're not gonna get what you're gonna give up that's always been like one of the hardest things about live action for me is that you only get what you get on the day and if you don't have enough time you don't get it um, as opposed to animation where you can constantly like make things better you can have every shot you can think of um, that can be done. Sometimes there are there are issues with budget, and you have to you know trim things down. But 
you can pretty much get every single piece exactly as you want it. Um, not so in live action. That's taken a little bit of getting used to. Here we have uh, Nerissa's arrival in um, Times Square. And these two pieces were cut, were filmed separately and uh, stitched together. So we did a big camera move in the middle of second unit, did a big camera move in the middle of um, Times Square off of the, um, off of the, the, the manhole cover. And then we shot, and we recorded that move, and then we shot Susan Sarandon on a set, on stage with green screen. And um, had that same, because the camera move was recorded, we could do that same exact move and they'd match up. Nerissa walking through town was originally much longer. And we got a couple of shots. And then what happened was we got a big crowd and the police showed up and they shot us down. Susan was convinced that they shut us down because of, you know, her political beliefs. And I guess she had spoken out against the police department. So she was sure that that's why they were shoot shutting us down. But um, that's what happened that day. And that's why we only have, I think, one or two shots. Uh, the King and Queen's Ball. Um, this is a set. It's not an actual ballroom. We built the whole thing knowing that we were going to have to do some practical effects in the, in, on the set that we couldn't do in a, in a location. Beautiful set. Stuart Wurzel did, did a wonderful job. Two weeks of rehearsal for these dancers to be ready for a whole sequence with, um, with not only our main characters, focusing on our main characters, but surrounded by um, other dancers. This is one of the last steps for Giselle, and you'll see it physically. She, her hair is straight, it's no longer curly. She wears a, a very elegant gown, which feels like something you would wear to a normal um, event, like a, a, a black tie event. And she is now totally out of place in a room that's filled with fantasy, or put on fantasy, right? Because they're all play acting. Robert is dressed just like the, uh, the, 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 the model that Giselle was making at the very beginning. And you can compare those two and see how they look. Um, very, very similar. Also, if you look at Nancy, we're preparing her to take that jump into the fantasy world because Nancy ultimately goes into animation and we sort of turn her into a princess for this scene just as a way to, to give us a visual sort of foot up. And she's also like enamored with Edward. Edward says exactly what he is thinking. You know, there's no playing of games and she sort of responds to that as that being sort of attractive to her. We also do something with the music here. As if you've noticed, we start an animation, the characters sing. Um, there's an evolution to the songs. Giselle comes into the real world, she sings, she enchants the world, she brings the world into her songs, and then as she changes and takes this step to become more human, more, more real, I would say, the song leaves the character's mouth, they no longer sing in the movie, and it's taken over and sung, the song is sung in a real space. So the song is, is the songs sort of support Giselle's movement, her arc, her character arc. This song is sung by John McLaughlin, and um, we really just, I got a bunch of, from a music supervisor, I got a, I got a bunch of artists who were up and coming, and uh, he just felt right. And we asked him if he wanted to be in the movie, and that's him actually singing back there. All the lighting changes. I remember when we first put this together, we went through all the lighting cues to make sure we had it all in place, and they were, it was lit like a real ballroom. And I wanted to go with something that was more fantastic, something that could support the emotional um, journey of the characters during this song. So we actually brought in Jules Fisher um, and uh, Peggy Geisenhauer, and they're known for their Broadway work. I think they had done some work on Chicago as well, the movie Chicago. And um, we just want to theatricalize everything. So they came in, and I think in three days, they turned around a whole lighting plot that would support the emotional tone of, of, of the scene. 
you'll notice in a moment, oh, this scene right here coming off the candelabra, it's totally Beauty and the Beast, right? It's that scene in the ballroom where you have the computer-generated candelabra go by and you move past it down to them dancing. It's totally what we did here. And um, at this moment where they feel completely alone, we move all of the actors, all of the dancers off to the side. We change the lighting scheme so that everybody in the background gets darker and blue and in the middle we're hit with pinks and we bring sort of this emotional lift to the piece which is we, we pummel them, actually what happened on the day, with glitter. Um, big pieces of, of glitter and um, ultimately it wasn't enough for me so we had to add, in some of the shots, add uh, CGI glitter to, uh, to, to fill it out. But it really gave them a sense of being isolated and alone. And then Nancy comes into the scene and the lighting all changes right back. She interrupts it. And it goes back to where we were before. All the dancers crowd in and move around them. And um, Giselle leaves. She decides to leave. And they are heading back to Andalasia. Edward's bringing her back. And Nancy, you can tell, looks at him, looks at Robert with an eye, she knows that something is up. So we're trying to support her emotional change heading towards um, becoming an animated princess. Um, although I, I, I don't know why Nancy never became like, in, became part of the princess doll line. I, I can't figure that out. Anyway, um, so she's alone, watching down below. She sees them kiss and into the scene comes a hag. She'll be here in a moment. She's still watching them kiss. We, we played this for, for all it was worth. Um, and Nancy notices that the kiss is, the kiss is not, quite, not quite up to par to, to the, the emotional connectiveness they've had in the past. The song ends. Giselle thinks from afar that it's over, and the hag shows up. Um, this is the same, this is a real life manifestation of the hag from the animated section. Rick Baker, uh, the esteemed uh, makeup artist, um, did this piece for us. I had known through friends that he had, he had done this for himself. Um, he did a makeup for himself. He went out, went out with his family for Halloween one year and he was an old hag um, from Snow White. And um, so he did this makeup. It's, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it so matches the animation. And I think Susan, like, just, just inhabits this character when she has this makeup on. It transforms her. Ah, the apple. The apple. We're going to follow this. So this is, of course, from Snow White, right? And the hag is a manifestation of the evil queen as a hag in, in Snow White. Um, her teeth and fingernails just creep me out. So... It's really about convincing Giselle to, to give up everything, to, to, go back, to go back to Andalasia not having a single thought about what happened here, that she can wipe it all away. And Giselle decides to take it on. I mean, you can see on her face, and all of that's real. She's, you know, she's, she had been crying, and her nose is watering a little bit. Um, that's really how how in the in the moment um, Amy was during all of this, and like Snow White, she bites. Oh, that grosses me out. When when Susan does it a couple of times, she does this tongue thing, which is like it just creeps me out. The apple, the apple starts out as a real apple. I have it right here, and um, not a real apple actually. It's a rubber apple, and it bounces. And as it went down the stairs, we transitioned it into a, um, a CGI apple, which, uh, which Robert picks up and uh, lifts up to his face. Um, and uh, the hag takes Giselle. We're going to do a couple of scenes in here that sort of mimic Sleeping Beauty. Her being thrown on the ground is like Sleeping Beauty, having, you know, having fallen asleep, having pricked her finger. Um, and then when Edward interrupts the scene, Nerissa pulls back her cape, and that's exactly a scene from Sleeping Beauty, 
pulls back her cape and reveals um, Giselle on the floor as as Maleficent revealed uh, Aurora. This next section was was fairly difficult to conceive. It's so long, and the characters are 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 each in their own little groups trying to figure out what's going on. Um, we rehearsed this for a long time. It took us, a, it took us quite a bit to pull it all together. Um, and I, I remember there being, there being some tensions in the room trying to figure it all out because everybody has their own agenda in the scene. Everybody's coming at it from a different point of view and it created some, some, so, some, we had to navigate, I guess. It created some, some, some pathways that we had to navigate. Um, we did get those all figured out, and once we got them figured out, we shot the scene, I want to say, for four days. There's that much going on in it. Um, and we did do a little extra photography, additional photography at the end, especially with um, Nathaniel and Narissa because we didn't tie up their story well enough so we went back and figured that out. Um, so anytime, so some of the shots when you're looking at Narissa up against the side or Nathaniel grabbing the sword and putting it up against Narissa's neck, that's all additional photography. Um, and I think there are a couple of shots of, of Edward as well. Um, I mean, we have this beautiful room and we're so lucky to, to use it as a backdrop and all those extras as a backdrop for every time you're looking at, at Robert. I mean, it just feels so alive and so rich. Um, it, it's, I mean, it's just stunning in its, in its, in its creation. The Stroke of Midnight, of course, that's from Cinderella. I mean. We all know that, so they basically have a minute to figure out uh, how to um, how to solve this, and uh, we all know that uh, the time that we took on screen to make it happen is much longer than a minute. So we kind of tried to uh, try to condense or, or or tried we elongated time, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, Nancy, she knows and she gives permission for Robert to, to kiss Giselle. She knows that they're in love. And um, I was always amazed that, uh, that Amy sat there through probably three days of, of shooting. She just laid on that couch and pretended, you know, to be, to be asleep. Um, I think she even fell asleep a couple of times, for real. We're going to move into a more action-oriented section of this, and we're going to take it all up into a, a whole nother, whole nother level. These two old women here, I wanted it so badly to be Mary Costa and Eileen Woods, who were the, the speaking voices of, of Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella, they were still alive. I contacted them, I wrote them a letter, I begged them to be in it, and um, they both didn't, didn't, wanna, didn't wanna partake. I don't quite know why. Um, maybe, maybe they were just done with it, done with the film business. Narissa getting down these stairs was tough. We had to cut all around it because honestly, Susan couldn't walk in, in her dress very well, and she couldn't get down the stairs. And now we do exactly what we did in animation. We try to replicate that in this scene. Um, we, we shot it with, um, with the whole room present, all of the extras. We put uh, stunt doubles of, of Edward and um, Nathaniel on cables and yanked them out of the scene so they flew backwards. And um, just did whatever we could to physicalize it, shook the, shook the chandeliers. And then um, Nerissa appears and she's a CGI dragon for the rest of the movie. We tried to make it look like her to a certain extent. We were absolutely thinking about um, Maleficent as a dragon from Sleeping Beauty. Only Maleficent um, 
I'm not sure she, I don't think she spoke as a dragon. I think she laughed. So she had to totally articulate um, this whole thing. This back wall um, is all made to, to, to break out. And in fact, um, what we did was we, we, we built it without the, wall, without, with the section missing. And then we put the section in with CGI and busted it out with the, you know, with the, with the visual effects. The glass slipper, we set that up. Another Easter egg from, um, from um, Cinderella. And then we go out onto the roof. And all of this is a stitched stitch together pieces. We did some um, aerial photography. Um, we did, we, we created sections of the building and surrounded it with green screen. We put, um, we put uh, Patrick in a mechanical arm and swung him all about. I had a great ride on it one day. That was fun. Um, and we just stitched all these pieces together. And the reason we could do that was that Tom Schlesny, my visual effects supervisor, um, was out with us while we were shooting this. And he built a model of the top of the Walworth Tower. We originally thought it was gonna be the Chrysler building, but they wouldn't let us use it. And he used the storyboards, and then he went in and he shot scene by scene, every shot, either either like a, a little doll in his hand for Nerissa, or um, you know, a, a, a paper dragon that he made um, to, um, to, just to figure out what we were gonna do, how the pieces were all gonna to fit together, it was like, a, like a puzzle. Um, I remember like in thinking of a shot in the moment of looking down at Nancy and Nathaniel and Edward, and um, it meant putting our camera up in the rig and we hadn't planned it. And um, it was a little bit of an issue. There was a little bit of pushback, but I, but I kind of, I, I really wanted it. And um, Don Burgess figured out how to do it because we didn't have the right equipment to make it happen, but um, he figured it out. And I think the, the, the down shot sort of going, you know, looking down on them is, is really impressive. So now we're going to play out exactly how we did with the troll in the animated opening. All of the events sort of take place. The spire bends, Robert gets thrown up in the air, Giselle throws the sword, it catches him at the last minute by his shirt. Wouldn't happen in real life, but... Um, and then the um, Pip, Pip is the counterweight, and when he steps off, Nerissa falls to her death. In, um, you know, in the opening, the troll got flung away. In this version, Nerissa um, hits the ground, and we didn't want to have a bloody big dragon on the ground. Um, so we came up with this idea that she'd um, turn back into glitter. Um, so, and then we play it out as we played it out, you know. Robert falls, Giselle catches him, just like in the animated section. This all sliding down was all done um, flat, and we tilted our camera, and we actually, they ride on this little wheeled buggy that pulls them down. It's raining, they're wet, and we're just sliding the camera that's at an angle along with them to make it look like they're actually at an angle. It worked out really well, and, uh, and I think uh, everybody, everybody sort of, I, I think they enjoyed that ride as well. I didn't get the ride on that one, unfortunately. Um, they, uh, they kiss, we do this mammoth pullback. They're on a little tiny piece of set. And we had two sound stages at Steiner Studios. And we connect, we open the doors between them and we pulled the camera back as far as we could. Um, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty, a pretty mammoth move. The whole thing turns into a, a storybook. We know we're heading toward our toward our ending. And Nancy finds the shoe. And Edward shows up. They they connect. He, like in Cinderella, places the shoe on her foot and says, a perfect fit. He begins to sing. And then Adina joins him in song, and we have a big, down, a big duet that happens in this moment. Um, oh, wait a minute. We cut it. So all of you have been asking me about Adina, and why didn't she get a song? Well, she had a song. And what we found out was that it just stopped the action right at the end of the movie, 
we've already know we, we've, we've set up all these little these little hints that she is that she's changing that she's making the turn and she didn't have to sing a song in order to convince us that she was willing to go to um, Andalasia so I thought that maybe she would sing this the you know maybe we would use her to sing this the Zen song enchanted I, I mean it was called enchanted that was the original song and um, ever ever after and uh, she just wasn't a big enough radio star at the time um, she wasn't a big recording artist uh, so the music department wouldn't allow us wouldn't let me use her um, I think the eggs on their face because I mean look what's happened um, here we are at uh, Nancy's studio, which has now been turned into Giselle's studio, and she's holding on to her naive sense of self. And um, she now makes dresses for, for little girls, princess dresses. So she hasn't let go of that part of herself. That was really important to me. I didn't want it to be that she changed and became cynical. No, you can, you can live in this world being kind-hearted and open and express yourself honestly. Um, Maybe one of my, uh, maybe one of the drawbacks of being me as a film director is that I is that I truly think that way. I, I truly believe in those aspects, and I'm I don't have that cynical edge. The last piece of Giselle, she's dressed as anybody would dress every single day of their lives. Um, I remember Patrick not wanting to do this dancing, and him doing this cowboy thing was making fun of the fact that he was dancing, and then we used it. <laughs> we thought uh, we thought it just felt like. He had now taken a turn too, that that dance, him being silly, allowed us to show the audience that he had changed. And uh, we hit the end. I remember being kind of upset after we shot it because I realized that Robert was wearing brown and I wanted him to be dressed in color now to, to visually support that. But I think it, I think it comes across. Um, and here we are in the credits. We're on the home stretch here. Um, the credits were designed by you and co and um, it's just an homage to everything that we were doing during the film just little snippets of hidden hidden uh, Easter eggs you know there's there are vines and flowers and wishing wells and frogs and all sorts of things that show up during this um, it's really sweet the maybe I can think of a couple of stories about the release of the movie so one of the things that happened was when we were first starting to make the movie, the marketing department tried to shut us down. They didn't think that the movie would make any money, that it was really worth making. And um, luckily, others that were involved were really into it, and they gave the marketing department a lot of pushback. Um, so we made the movie, and it just so happened that as we were finishing the movie, the head of marketing became the head of the live action division. <laughs> so it was sort of an interesting give and take in this moment because obviously if you tried to shut down a movie 10 times and now it's done, you don't want it to actually do well. You want to be right, right? So um, luckily we had a test screening. We got like a, I want to say we got like a 93 was our score. Everyone was kind of shocked. And we did a little focus group afterwards, and they had nothing but positive things to say about the movie. And we noticed that the guy who was running the focus group was, was baiting that group to say something bad. <laughs> and they didn't. They didn't have a bad thing to say about the movie, which sort of had to like shut everybody up. Anybody who was a doubter, that was worried about the movie making any money just had to follow through now because the audience, the audience had spoken. We, um, we, I, if you look at the trailer, you'll you'll notice that it's totally geared towards boys. They were so afraid that boys wouldn't come to see the movie, and what they sort of found out was that every boy who went to see the movie actually liked the movie ultimately. Then it may have been may have been harder to get them in. To the movie, but they all they all really loved the movie. The movie did really well opening uh, Thanksgiving Day, two thousand and seven, and ended up doing about three hundred and forty million dollars worldwide. So it's um it's something that I'm really proud of, really really proud of. 
boy, when I see all these names go by, it just reminds me of how many people it takes to pull one of these things together. And I'm sure, I'm sure I did not mention like half of the people that I wanted to or planned to, but as you do this, you're just talking so, so fast um, that, you, uh, that you forget a lot. Um, we storyboarded the whole opening of the movie, um, the animated section, and I took advantage of that to storyboard the entire movie. So Troy Quain took care of the, the animated section, and then I supervised storyboarding the rest of the movie. We put it up on reels, because I had noticed that when I did 102, I didn't use the tools of an animator to make the movie. And um, I thought, well, maybe that was, maybe I need these tools. These are my tools. So we animated, we didn't animate, we storyboarded the entire film. Um, Greg Perler, one of our editors, um, who I've worked with on everything, great, great man, um, talented, talented man, put together reels for me. I watched those reels. We did rewrites based on those reels, and I never showed them to anyone because there was this great fear that if I showed them to the executives, they wouldn't know how to read story reels. They weren't used to knowing what they were, and it's pretty rough. Um, I had also recorded the, the actors. I sat them all down and we did a read through of the script. So I used that read through as the, as the vocal tracks for the, for the animatic. And um, so I didn't let them see it because there was a fear that they would, the executives would close it down, would close down the movie because they'd make some assumption about the movie. But I got to take a piece of my, my process. And I've heard people since, you know, I, like Peter Jackson talks about storyboarding everything. And, you know, he was in a great place where he could actually show that to everyone. Um, I didn't quite have that kind of clout, so I was sort of afraid to do that. Um, I also filled the halls with artwork um, and would take um, the executives, mostly executives, sometimes actors that we were wooing. I'd take them on a little tour of the movie, and that gave me a visual um, that I could use as I, was, uh, as I was telling the story of the film. Um, and I think that's kind of why we got a green, green light ultimately, is that I showed Dick Cook that tour, brought him on that tour, and the next day we were, you know, we had had a green light and we were making the film. Boy, something else to say about the songs, perhaps. Um, there were a couple of songs. There was another song that we wrote for the movie that we didn't use, and that was Norris's song. Um, Alan and Stephen wrote a song that didn't quite move the story forward, so we, uh, we didn't use it. And ultimately, probably a good thing, because if we had to have her sing that song while she was walking down the streets of New York, we would have been in big trouble, because we would have never been able to film it, um, having been shut down and all. Um, from the score standpoint, I think it came pretty easily for Alan. Um, it was right in his wheelhouse. And I think maybe the, the, the more difficult sections for him were the, 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 the spanning the animated sections into like the more real. Um, I tend to remember us working on the more real scenes, the, things, the scenes that played more real life um, more often. And one scene I remember we, we scored and scored and scored, and that's the little montage where they go shopping. And we just couldn't figure out what it was. And we were using, he was writing new pieces of music. He was using um, True Love's Kiss, Giselle's theme. And finally he hit upon using a song that we didn't hear till later in the movie, Ever Ever After. And I think that's pretty smart because it allowed, it allowed you to have that song in your head that when you got to the end of the movie, it just felt like a glove, right? It felt like you already knew it because you'd already heard it, right? Um, it's pretty, pretty sneaky of us, and I'm really glad that, that Alan figured that out. Um, there's a great little music video that, uh, that James Baxter did with uh, Carrie Underwood singing uh, Ever Ever After, um, which is neat. I, I had nothing to do with it, but I loved seeing the animation that, uh, that he did for that. And um, boy, it was, you know, all around a remarkable experience for me because I really got to take my two great loves. You know, I was a puppeteer and a theater actor to begin with. 
and to do to bring live action and animation together and speak to this uh, medium that I adored was um, was a was a wonderful thing. And you know, Dick Cook, I was just talking to him recently, and he said to me, "You know, Kev, I think." You know, it took us seven years to get this movie together because it was waiting for you. And that, that really touches me.